Hello, friends, and welcome to our video lecture on topic B3.1, gas exchange in plants. There's a separate video for gas exchange in animals. Our guiding questions, how are multicellular organisms adapted to carry out gas exchange? And we're also going to look at similarities and differences in gas exchange between a flowering plant and a mammal. And our objectives for today, we're going to talk about the vital need for gas exchange in living things. We're going to talk about characteristics of gas exchange surfaces and adaptations that leaves have for gas exchange. We're going to sketch out a plan diagram for the distribution of tissues in leaves. We're going to talk about how transpiration is the consequence of gas exchange. We're going to look at different methods for calculating stomata density. We'll talk about what stomata are in a couple slides. We're going to wrap up with a comparison and contrasting of gas exchange in mammals and in plants. Gas exchange in unicellular organisms like these chlorella algae cells is generally pretty easy. Gases can just diffuse in and out of each one of those individual cells. In us multicellular organisms, there are some challenges. We have to work pretty hard to manage gas exchange for all of the cells in all of our bodies. Um, we're going to talk about how plants overcome those challenges in this lecture. Gas exchange is incredibly important to living things due to the need for us to carry out energy conversion processes of cellular respiration in us animals and plants carry out both respiration and also photosynthesis. Oxygen gas needed for respiration, carbon dioxide gas needed for photosynthesis. Exchanging these gases allows living things to continue carrying out these processes of respiration and photosynthesis. There are some characteristics common to gas exchange surfaces in multicellular organisms, like this beautiful axolotl with its external gills. And the cross section of this plant leaf, we're going to focus on this part of the leaf called the spongy mesophyll. Spongy mesophyll is spread out a lot. That's going to give that tissue a large surface area for lots of gas exchange. It's thin. We're not sending gases through super thick layers of cells. Um, it is moist so that those gases can dissolve in the water. And then it's permeable. And that allows, again, those gases to move pretty easily into the bodies of these organisms. We're going to focus on generalized plants, so like the most average of average plants that you can think of. We know that there are lots of adaptations for plants in different parts of the world in different environments that allow them to survive, carry out gas exchange, but also not lose too much water. So here we've got super crazy big broad leaves in tropical rainforest. This allows them to capture as much light as possible. Uh, not a lot of light gets to the bottom of the rainforest due to all those layers of the canopy. Those big broad leaves allow for the most uh, efficient energy capture possible. Here we've got aloe. Aloe lives in a drier climate. Um, more access to sun. It doesn't need to work super hard to capture light. It does have to work really hard, though, to prevent water loss. And so it's got this beautiful thick layer of cuticle. Cuticle is a waxy covering on lots of leaves that helps to prevent water loss. This cactus also has lots of cuticle, but the cuticle is on its stem. The stem is all of the body of the cactus. The leaves, rather than being big and broad to capture lots of sun, cactuses do not have to work very hard to capture sunlight. Instead, they have adapted their leaves to be spines. And those spines are going to prevent animals from eating the tissues that are storing the water. The leaves of our generalized plants, our super average plants, also have lots of adaptations. Those adaptations help those leaves carry out gas exchange. We're going to start on the bottom of the leaf. Bottoms of leaves have some pretty cool openings that are called stomata. Stomata is plural. Stoma is singular. One stoma, lots of stomata. These are basically like the noses of plants, I guess, kind of, sort of. Um, the gases are going to be able to move in and out of the leaf through these stomata. We're going to have carbon dioxide diffusing into the leaf because there is a higher concentration of carbon dioxide outside than there is inside. Inside the leaf, because there's a lots of photosynthesis occurring, we're going to have a concentration of oxygen buildup, oxygen gas produced in photosynthesis, that oxygen higher concentration inside the leaf than outside, and so that oxygen will diffuse out. 
Unfortunately for the plant, sometimes if it's very dry or warm, the concentration of water vapor inside the leaf will be higher than the concentration of water vapor outside. And so water will also leave the plant through the stomata. What's kind of cool, plants can actually close those stomata should they be losing too much water. The plant needs to conserve its water when it's super hot or dry or at night when it doesn't need the CO2 for photosynthesis. Then these super cool cells called guard cells will actually close off the stomata. So here we can see a closed stomata. We've got guard cell, we've got guard cell. They have closed the stomata. Here, it's kind of weird. The guard cells actually swell and that causes them to be kind of rigid and that causes them to open up. And here we have that stomata for the CO2 to get in and the O2 to get out and also some water vapor coming out. Other structures within the leaf that allow it to carry out gas exchange, we've got the spongy mesophyll. Spongy mesophyll is all of this super cool part of the plant. That spongy mesophyll has lots of air spaces that allow for gas exchange, lots of cells separate from each other for more surface area, for more gas exchange. Just above the spongy mesophyll, we have our palisade mesophyll. These guys are packed together. So this is not gas exchange. Palisade mesophyll is adapted for photosynthesis. So the majority of photosynthesis that occurs in a leaf is going to happen in the palisade mesophyll. These guys are stacked super, super close to the top of the leaf to gather the most sunshine energy to carry out the most photosynthesis possible. At the very top surface of the leaf, we have the upper epidermis. It's like the skin of the leaf. Its job is protection. And then covering the upper epidermis, we've got that waxy cuticle. Plants that live in drier, warmer spaces are going to have thicker cuticle layers. Plants that live where it's super humid, they don't need that wax nearly as much. We might be asked at some point to draw a plan diagram of a generalized leaf. Plan diagrams are super simple. They're going to show really just the distribution of tissues. There is no need to draw individual cells or molecules for sure in these plan diagrams. If we were to draw a plan diagram for our lovely cross section of a leaf, I'm going to start with a little layer of upper epidermis. That layer that is a protective layer on top of the plant. Just under that, I'm going to draw the palisade mesophyll, palisade mesophyll, of course, where we have the great majority of our photosynthesis occurring. Under the palisade mesophyll, we're going to have our spongy mesophyll, spongy mesophyll, where we have gas exchange occurring. And then under the spongy mesophyll, we're going to have our lower epidermis, that other protective skin layer. I'm going to add in, kind of previewing what we're going to talk about in our next lecture, a vascular bundle, a vascular bundle. Remember that vascular tissue vessels, um, when we looked at the transport system of animals, we talked about veins and arteries and capillaries. In plants, they also have some vessels, they have transport systems, but let me pick a better color. Um, instead of having veins and arteries, they have xylem and phloem. And so we're going to add in some phloem. We're going to add in some xylem. We'll talk a lot more about this in our next lecture on transport in plants. Our gas exchange surfaces need to be moist in order for those gases to be able to dissolve and move across the cell membranes. In addition, in plants and those leaves, because photosynthesis is occurring, and one of the steps of photosynthesis is photolysis, that splitting of the water molecules, so that we can produce some hydrogen ions and some electrons to carry out those light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis. We need lots of water in the leaves. But when the stomata are open, we're also going to have that water vapor leading. We need to replace that water and that occurs through transpiration. Transpiration is the movement of the water from the roots up the stem and then out the leaves. We call this the transpiration pull. We'll talk more about it in our lecture on transportation in plants. But it's also important for gas exchange because if transpiration is not occurring, gas exchange cannot occur. 
if the plant needs to close down the stomata to prevent too much water loss, then the plant is also cutting off gas exchange. Interestingly, there are some things that affect the rate of transpiration, how fast that water can get moved up to the leaves to keep them nice and moist to make gas exchange more efficient. One of the things, of course, is light. The more light there is, the faster transpiration is going to occur. Another factor is temperature. The warmer things are, the faster that water is going to evaporate out of the leaves, the higher our rate of transpiration. Another interesting aspect is humidity. There's only so much water that can be uh, dissolved in air, only so much water vapor that can be dissolved in air. And as temperature changes, so does that content, that humidity that is possible. The more humid the environment is, the higher the concentration of water vapor outside the plant, the slower transpiration is going to occur because transpiration, this gas exchange, is all about concentration gradients. And I need a higher concentration inside the plant in order for that water vapor to leave the plant. If we have a higher concentration gradient of water vapor outside, then we're not going to have that water move. Transpiration is going to slow down. The number of stomata that plant have can be an adaptation to its environment, just like its cuticle thickness or its leaf shape. So here we're going to look at how we can calculate stomatal density, how many stomata are there in every square millimeter of a leaf's surface. There are a couple different ways that we can count our stomata and calculate areas. We can just peel the epidermis off of a leaf, put it on our microscope, and then count and calculate. We can also make castings. We can paint our leaf's surface with clear nail polish let it dry, peel the nail polish off of the leaf, and then count, analyze that casting, that nail polish that has all the divots on the surface of the leaf. I'm going to look at sample D here. You can see that it's got a much lower stomatal density than does uh, this guy C. Um, how am I going to do this? Number one, I'm going to count my stomata. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I have eleven stomata in sample D. To find the area, I need to do some super amazing conversions. So here I've got my scale bar. My scale bar is 100 micrometers big. I'm going to use my ruler on my screen. Yours is going to be a different size, so you do you. Um, but my ruler on my screen says that that is one centimeter big. That's the same thing as 10 millimeters big. I'm going to measure now the length of the um, sample that I'm looking at here. And my ruler says that that is 85 millimeters. And so when I do some cross multiplying and dividing, I find there are 850 micrometers there. Do the same thing here. It was 58 millimeters. That's going to be 580 micrometers with my proportions. Next up, I'm going to find the area. So I can go ahead and calculate area length times width with my micrometers, but I actually want to get down to millimeters squared eventually. So I'm going to go ahead and turn my micrometers into millimeters, divide by 1,000. So 1, 2, 3, so 0.58 millimeters and one, two, three, point eight five millimeters. So my area is going to be 0 0.85 times 0 0.58. That's 0.493 square millimeters. And so when I do 11 stomata divided by 0 0.493 square millimeters, I'm going to get a grand total of 22 point lots and lots of um, decimal places, I'm going to round to just these two significant figures, 22 stomata per square millimeter. That negative exponent means that we are dividing. And we're going to wrap up here with a look at some similarities and differences in gas exchange between animals and plants. If you want to review the animal lecture before you do this, 
it's the other B3.1 lecture video that we've got here on YouTube. So some of the things that are in common, those similarities between animals and plants in terms of gas exchange, of course, both of them are going to be exchanging carbon dioxide and oxygen. We're going to have that exchange happen due to differences in concentration. Those amazing concentration gradients allows for gas exchange to happen passively. We're also going to have those thin, and moist surfaces with lots and lots of surface area to carry out lots and lots of gas exchange. Things that animals have different, we have those alveoli in our lungs as opposed to the uh, stomata and the spongy mesophyll in our plants. Animals are going to mostly pull oxygen in and CO2 out. For plants, especially during the daylight when lots of car um, carbon dioxide is needed for photosynthesis, we're going to have more CO2 in and more O2 out. We're going to, in plants, be able to pause gas exchange by closing off those uh, stomata with their guard cells when we want to prevent water loss. Animals don't have this option. There is a continuous gas exchange. No pausing possible. And on that note, my friends, we have achieved all of our objectives. We talked about that vital need for gas exchange. We need CO2 for photosynthesis. We need oxygen for respiration. We talked about characteristics of gas exchange surfaces. They are thin, they are moist, they are permeable. There's lots and lots of surface area. Adaptations in the leaves, we have that spongy mesophyll. There are the stomata with the guard cells. We talked about our plan diagrams. So those super simple sketches that are showing the distributions of the tissues in the leaves. We talked about how transpiration, that movement of water from the roots up the stems, out the leaves is the consequence of gas exchange in the leaves. We talked about how we can calculate stomatal density. And then we wrapped up with our lovely Venn diagram comparing and contrasting gas exchange in mammals and in plants. Great work today.